Hello, good evening, everyone. I think we can get started. Um, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 2024 Dallas Mice Memorial Lecture. My name is Yuan Yin. Uh, I'm assistant professor in the School of Communication at SFU, and I'll be introducing the lecture tonight. First, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that at Simon Fraser University, we are located on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Coquitlam, Kwangti, Kekat, Kwantlam, Semiamu, and Tawasan peoples. Dallas Mice was a thinker who was deeply concerned with the question of imperialism, colonialism, and capitalism. And the focus is one that's worth upholding as critical scholars. Our wonderful graduate student, Sami Jong, will be introducing the 2024 my speaker, Professor Ya Wenlei, shortly. And before that, I'll spend a few minutes discussing the scholar whose contributions we are marking today. First, please allow me to say some quick thank yous. I'd like to thank Andrew Ringer, Brenda Bowen, Gary Cho, and Anna Brophy in the School of Communication for assisting with organization of this event. I'd also like to express my gratitude for the remarkable work that I'm Joho, Samantha Waters, Joy Balbon, Melbourne, sorry, Julia Alki and the Fox in tech support and the Van City Office of Community Engagement have put in to help with the organization and promotion of this memorial lecture. And I'd like to thank the School of Communication and the Faculty of Communication, Art and Technology and David Lamb Center for their support of this event. I'd also like to take a quick moment to thank you all for attending the lecture tonight. Please stick around after the Q&A since there will be a following, uh, reception following at Wood Art Center in this building on the second floor. Each year, the, Smith, the Dallas Smith Memorial Lecture recognizes a critical scholar whose contributions have significantly impacted or bear important implications for the political economy of communication. Dallas Mice was a professor of communication at SFU from 1976 until he passed away in 1992. He's now recognized globally as a leading scholar of communication as well as a founding figure in the political economy com approach to communication. Three decades after his passing, Smythe's work and insights remain more relevant than ever in contemporary discussions surrounding digital media, technologies, advertising, and the global political economy of communication. His call for incorporating labor into communication studies has, ta has been taken up by generations of scholars. His theory of the audience commodity continues to be debated in discussions of user-generated content and digital labor on digital platforms. And his analysis of cultural imperialism, it's a touchstone of geopolitical approaches to communication studies, even as it is revised, expanded upon, and contested for its own blind spots by contemporary critical scholars. Smythe's scholarship was deeply marked by his personal history and convictions. He was born in Canada and trained as an economist in the United States before returning home after being blacklisted for belonging to pacifist and social justice organizations during the Cold War. Smythe's political commitment was a constant through the course of his life, and exactly, it's it, exactly that unrelenting scholarship and those of political convictions that we need more than ever in these troubling times. And before we begin, today we would like to take a special moment to remember a friend of the School of Communication, Professor Vincent Mosco. Mosco was a foundational figure in critical communication studies, a builder of progressively scholarly institutions in the field, an ally to social justice movements within and beyond the acad academy, and a generous mentor to dozens of communication scholars over several decades. He achieved all of it this while never forgetting where he came from, a tenement on Mulberry Street on Manhattan's Lower East Side. Moscow was one of the founders of Dallas Mice Memorial Lecture and contributed to the lecture's advisory committee until he passed away earlier this year. Moscow helped to shape the perspective and research of so many scholars who, had, who have delivered the lecture over the years, and we will continue to honor his legacy at this yearly event. Now I'm delighted to hand the mic to our excellent graduate student, Sami Jung, uh, from School of Communication here at SFU to introduce our speaker, Professor Ya Wenlei. Sami.
Thank you, Sian. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm very delighted to introduce you to Dr. Yawen Lei as our speaker of the 2024 Dallas Smith Memorial Lecture. It is our genuine pleasure and honor to have Dr. Lei join us tonight in person, and a special thanks to her for flying all the way from uh, the East Coast. So Professor Lei is professor in the Department of Sociology at Harvard University. She is also affiliated with the Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies and the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs at Harvard. Trained in both law and sociology, she holds a LLM and a JSD from Yale Law School and a PhD in sociology from the University of Michigan. After graduating from Michigan in 2013, she was a junior fellow at the Society of Fellows at Harvard University from 2013 to 2016. In the academic year of 2018 to 2019, she served as a visiting professor at Sciences Po in France. She's the author of The Contentious Public Sphere, Law, Media, and Authoritarian Rule in China, and The Gilded Cage, Technostate Capitalism in China. She has published in various journals, including Annual Review of Sociology, American Sociological Review, and American Journal of Sociology, Law and Society Review, Work, Employment, and Society, Political Communication, and the China Quarterly. Her publications have received various awards from the American Sociological Association, the Law and Society Association, and the China Quarterly. And with that, it is my absolute delight to invite Dr. Lei to the stage, and we very much look forward to your talk. Thank you so much, um, uh, uh, Sammy, for the very kind, generous introduction. And I want to thank um, the School of um, Communication for inviting me uh, to Vancouver. Um, it's really a lovely uh, city. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, my new book, The Gilded Cage, uh, Technology Development and State Capitalism in China. Uh, I want to bring, uh, begin my talk uh, by telling you a story uh, in 1998. Um, so in 1998, uh, President Clinton uh, visited China, and that was the time uh, when, um, so that was the first visit of American uh, president to China after the 1989 uh, Tiananmen Democratic Movement. And he, fa he was faced with a lot of criticism in the US. Uh, and uh, that, that visit uh, was to prepare for uh, US-China trade agreements and China's uh, accession to the World Trade Organization in uh, 2001. And, um, during his visit, uh, he gave a talk and he uh, hosted a roundtable in Shanghai Library uh, in which he discussed with a lot of panel uh, panelists in China about the future of China. And, um, he, and during his talk, uh, that he predicted about uh, the future of China. So he said that he believed uh, China will have a leap over a whole generation of economic experiences that older European country and uh, the US experienced because of uh, the technological revolution. And he believed that uh, China will be creating an industrialized and a post-industrial society at that, the same time. So 1998, um, was also a period in which there was a, a, a dot com boom in the U.S., and there were a lot of um, there was a lot of optimis optimism about the future of uh, internet related technology, and Clinton believed that uh, China and the U.S. will both benefit from collaboration especially in the tech area. And when we think about this from today's perspective, uh, we will find that things have changed uh, so much. And one person became very, very excited uh, when he saw, read uh, President Clinton's comment about uh, post-industrial society. Uh, that was uh, a professor in my department at Harvard Sociology, and that was the mentor, uh, that was the advisor of uh, Professor Moscow uh, 
right? And that person was uh, Professor Daniel Bell, and he was so excited to see the fact that uh, President Clinton used the term uh, post-industrial society. And then he called the National Security Council to ask who wrote uh, the script for President Clinton. And when he realized that uh, actually uh, President Clinton uh, improvised uh, uh, in, in, in talking about post-industrial society, he was, uh, pre uh, Professor Bill was very, very excited because that showed the power of his work. So since the 1960s and 70s, uh, Daniel Bell began to work on the concepts of uh, post-industrial society. So when people think about um, post-industrial society, usually uh, people think about the rise of service industry, right? And, but then if you read his work uh, uh, carefully, you would find that um, Bale um, kind of theorized that some one critical feature of post-industrial uh, society is the mutually uh, generative relation between science, technology, and economy, and uh, most importantly, the enhancement of instrumental power based on technology over people. So he imagined that uh, when the post-industrial society comes, that's the era in which um, someone with in, in, in instrumental, someone, if, if one control society, then they, they would have a lot of power um, in the society. And he also talk, think about the order or the design, the rules of the game in post-industrial society. So in the 60s, he wrote that the design of post-industrial society is a game between person in which intellectual technology based on information, data, computing, algorithm, and programming rise alongside machine uh, uh, technology. So these are the things we have been talking about today. But he wrote about, he kind of predicted uh, about the rise of these kind of things uh, back in the 60s. And when he wrote his book on a post-industrial society, um, at that time, so that was the time in which uh, the New Deal order still dominated in the U.S. So basically, uh, uh, there was like regu government, uh, government regulations on a lot of different spheres um, in life, and then, and there was uh, the, and, and at that time the welfare state uh, in the U.S. was still uh, was uh, has not um, did not was still in place. And then, so his imagination about post-industrial society was a society, is a society in which the welfare state still plays a very important role. And then he was quite opt optimistic about um, the future, um, bro uh, uh, the future, um, because he thinks technology would bring about sheer prosperity. He didn't really expect that uh, inequality would become a serious problem in the future at that time. And then, but then we experience uh, the transition from the New Deal order to the new liberal orders. So he didn't really build, didn't really expect uh, in the 70s uh, the rise of the new liberal order, new liberal globalization um, at that time. And decades after he wrote about the coming of the post industrial society, scholars um, already uh, show research about the reality in which um, technology uh, brought about change. And there has been a lot of critique on the kind of society we have today, um, especially in the US. Um, so um, scholars, for example, uh, Zub, Prof Professor Zubov and also Professor um, Ajemolu and Johnson uh, at MIT, um, they wrote about like the fact that um, technology has been used to replace uh, jobs through automation. And then uh, Professor Zubov also wrote, wrote, also wrote about surveillance in work and everyday life uh, by government and corporations. And for example, in the age of surveillance capitalism, he wrote, he critiqued like big techs and use technology and big data to predict uh, a lot of uh, human choices in the daily life. So they are able to, for example, collect data and then and, um, and have a lot of, for example, like advertisement campaign and predict uh, human 
uh, choices and influence uh, people's autonomy. And then they also show the, uh, like for example, Professor Ajumolo uh, also showed the resulting equality, uh, equality in the recent decades, and that's associated with uh, uh, technology. But they also emphasize that uh, different institutions and different narratives about technology and also collective actions can influence the relationship between technology and equality. It's not in necessary that uh, technology would lead to equality and things that matter is the kind of institution we have uh, in society. And now I want to uh, go back to the Chinese case. Um, so, um, in uh, to some degree, uh, pres uh, President Clinton's uh, prediction about China uh, realized. So um, in the past uh, few decades, so China transition from a more kind of labor-intensive export-oriented manufacturing to a, a more science and technology-oriented uh, economic development uh, model. So it has, um, uh, so China has become one of the two uh, uh, digital superpowers in the world. But then um, when we, uh, th and because of this, because of uh, the rapid uh, development in China, some people, some scholars argue that uh, China has been experiencing, uh, experiencing a gilded age. But um, at the same time, we also observe some kind of dark side of this kind of rapid uh, economic development. And to understand the other side of this uh, seemingly very successful uh, economic development, we have to revisit uh, the concept of um, the so-called uh, uh, Burkage economy. So um, in the, uh, after uh, China's economic reform began uh, in the late 70s, uh, Chinese, when Chinese officials talk about their economy, they usually use the term Burkage economy. Um, so they they use they, they use the term bird and cage to refer to China's economy and also the control of the government uh, over the economy. So they want the bird uh, to grow, but then they don't want to uh, they don't want the bird fly away. They want to keep the bird in the cage to control uh, the economy and control the birds. But then um, in the process of uh, economic development. Um, you see the evolving nature of birdcage economy. So in the past, um, government officials in China didn't distinguish any kinds of birds. Um, so, um, but then over time, when they began to pursue a more technology-oriented economy, they began to distinguish uh, new birds from old birds. So not bir birds are not equally good. They want to have cutting edge new birds. So that's kind of more high tech uh, industry and uh, sectors, and then in this and then the process also creates some kind of old birds. So that's uh, obsolete uh, capital and labor, and um, in this process uh, the internet sector arose as the pillar industry in China. And this sounds like wonderful, uh, but then uh, in during my research I also found like the bird. Uh, some questions about regarding birds and some questions regarding the cage. So, um, so China developed uh, within, just like uh, President Clinton mentioned, that it leap over a whole generation of experiences. So usually uh, developmental study scholars use the term time compressed uh, development to describe the rapid speed of uh, de development of in certain countries, for example, Korea and some East Asian countries. But then they, but these scholars still think, consider China as an outlier because the speed of development is so rapid. And in the process of um, from, so from the experiences of, uh, for example, like US and Euro European countries, you see this kind of development can create a group of, um, of people who were left, who could be left behind by the rapid process of uh, transformation as uh, evidenced by uh, deindustrialization in the US. So how to deal with old birds, obsolete, people who are, con who are considered obsolete by the government, and then and 
could become a problem. And also, even though China now become a power, like a technology powerhouse um, in the world, um, scholars also show um, that um, compared with many comparable country, in fact, uh, the labor force in China has the um, have the least level of education. So how to deal with um, people who could be left behind is a serious problem in China. And then, so there is also the questions about cage. So Daniel Bell tried to theorize that um, the order, the kind of rules of the game in post-industrial society. So what kind of rules and what kind of cage on the Chinese uh, uh, government uh, wanted to build in China to guide the techno uh, development also become an in, in, uh, issue. So, so in my book, I try to understand the social order and contradiction that have emerged in the, pro in the process of China's very rapid uh, technological development. I want to understand different social groups and how they are they have been impacted by this rapid transformation uh, process. Um, and I also want to spend uh, some time to talk about my methodology. So basically, my research covers the period from the mid-2000 to 2023. And, um, and we know that um, the economic, economic development in China has been very, very uneven. So, um, um, the, econo so the economic reform began in provinces in coastal China. And then, so there is a huge uh, uh, regional disparity between inland China and coastal China. So I was very lucky that I began to do uh, research in this province called Guangdong, uh, Guangdong in 2009, uh, just uh, bef after the financial uh, uh, crisis. And um, so I, because I had to write a uh, GS dissertation, and uh, in addition to my PhD dissertation at the same time. So my GS dissertation was horrible. It's about uh, intellectual property rights in China, and I didn't really want to finish my, uh, my dissertation. But then uh, my mother asked me to finish my dissertation. So even though my dissertation was horrible, I think one lesson I learned was really, uh, I think one real le lesson I learned is really, I'm, the, the, the best thing I learned is really to observe um, the rapid technological or oriented development in, in Guangdong province. That province was the province was the, the place where China's economic reform began. And so that was the best place I would argue to observe China's uh, techno uh, development and this kind of post-industrial transformation. So I was able to, and also because when I was working on my first book, I also did research in that uh, area. And then I gradually expand uh, my research in dif to different parts of China. So I did a lot of field work. And then after the COVID uh, uh, pandemic began, I wasn't able to do research in China anymore, but I was still able to do phone interview and online ethnography. And in my research, I also uh, analyze a lot of policy documents and uh, regulation. Um, and here I want to show you the setting in which I conducted my field work. And um, so Chinese government um, considers some kind of uh, people and some kind of capital as obsolete. And I um, conducted field work in some uh, labor-oriented, uh, more traditional, uh, traditional uh, manufacturing sectors. So I work uh, I did research in factories um, that were considered as obsolete by some local Chinese government. So, um, so usually, uh, and some uh, factory owners were very kind to me. They allow me to observe in uh, their workshop, and they even allow me to sit in their office. And that allowed me to, inter, uh, to observe not only workers, but also the regular interaction between local government officials and business owners in China. And, um, and, uh, and um, in the process of uh, techno development, uh, some manufacturers began to transform themselves. So they began to use like robots to replace uh, human workers because that showed that they became more high tech. 
And so I was able to do research in some uh, factories that undergone, uh, undergone that kind of uh, automation process. But um, in the process, uh, when I did research, uh, many, I, I, many of my, um, my um, interviewees who were factory workers, and they decided to quit their job and left uh, the manufacturing uh, industry. And because of the uh, rising uh, platform economy in China, um, so they moved from the more traditional manufacturing sector to the platform sector, and their job become, um, they moved their job, um, their job become like delivery workers uh, in the platform economy. So I was very lucky that I was able to follow them and to observe their new work uh, in the platform economy. And also I had the opportunity to interview a lot of uh, engineers uh, in China's uh, big techs. That's uh, how I conducted my field work. So basically, so in my book, uh, I try to um, show that um, in the process of uh, techno development, uh, so China moved from a more labor intensive, uh, export oriented manufacturing to um, uh, something I call uh, techno state capitalism, which is a digital uh, capital, digital uh, capitalist system in which um, the state, the government have some kind of uh, asymmetrically symbiotic relationship with uh, China's big techs. And in this process of uh, transformation, so the Chinese uh, government created a lot of uh, instruments uh, to guide. So remember Daniel Bell's uh, concept of like instruments. So um, they created a, a lot of instruments based on technology, technique, and law to guide this kind of transformation process. But then, um, and, but gradually, uh, um, they also give power to uh, China's tech companies. So China's tech company also became some kind of like cage builder. So they are a also able to participate in the making of uh, tech companies Tech, technological and legal instruments. And I argue that this kind of instrument are created by the government and the big companies, tech company, constitute some kind of cage in which all kinds of uh, uh, actors uh, live in, inside. Um, so, uh, and this kind of cage is, uh, has been constituted by like different kinds of uh, instruments. And this cage, this kind of rules of the game have consequences for different kind of social, social groups. So I, so I uh, want to understand uh, the unequal consequences of this kind of rules, uh, the social order, and the contradictions uh, that emerge in the process of techno uh, development. So now I want to show how this happened. Uh, so first, I want to talk about the cultural dimension, the ideological dimension um, of uh, techno development because culture really uh, matters. So, um, so even though um, this kind of uh, techno development, uh, I think, began to occur, I mean, the a project occurred in the mid 2000s but there has been a long standing of admiring science and technology since the, 19, the late 19th century because of the, the imperial, uh, imperialism. So uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Susan Greenhill, so in her book, she argued that so using science and technology to rejuvenate China has been the cultural DNA of the Chinese nation. And, um, and because of the, uh, the, the, the experience of uh, imperialism. And, but when we talk about uh, technological-oriented uh, economic development, and uh, when we think about like, a country that moves uh, the ladder of development, it seems to me that there is only one path. But in fact, there are different uh, imagination, different thinking about the relationship between uh, technology, inequality, and development, even among Chinese uh, very high uh, level of government officials. And some of, some of them think um, they don't like the idea too much because they worry that um, they want to think about 
the existing uh, disparity across different regions regions in China. I mentioned about like the developmental level in coastal China and inland China. Uh, are very different, and they also worry about the consequences, um, the adverse consequences uh, for uh, the working class. But um, the majority of government officials, they tend to downplay um, the tension between technology and equality. They want to set aside these kinds of problems and then just pursue development first. So. So despite the different views on the relation between technology, inequality, and development, in the end, uh, the highest uh, level of leader tried to uh, sideline these kind of uh, problems. And then um, I also want to uh, mention that um, it's not only government officials, like they really admire, they really worship technology, but this kind of uh, techno, uh, the, the uh, techno developmentalism um, is also a very a widespread among uh, the Chinese uh, population. So I analyze uh, like, uh, survey data across uh, across 60 countries uh, in the world based on world value survey data. It shows that um, Chinese uh, the pop Chinese uh, populace has the most um, optimistic and uncritical view on technology compared with other people in the world. So China stands out in terms of the overwhelming uh, optimistic attitude towards uh, technology. So that means that this kind of thinking uh, provides default support for policy, like techno I mean, development-oriented policy, despite the negative consequences. And in China, there is also a long standing of meritocracy, and that also provides a justification of unequal distribution outcomes uh, based on perceived contribution to development. Um, so that's the cultural dimension that really provides um, justification for um, China, uh, techno uh, development. And now I want to talk about the uh, the political and also the economic uh, economic condition that um, that enable uh, uh, the techno development. So um, already uh, before the two thousand eight uh, financial crisis, uh, coastal uh, provinces in China. So these are the province that. Uh, uh, sorry. So the province that. Um, Yeah. So, so coastal province, I could not. Um, so, uh, there are several provinces in China. They actually are the like richest uh, provinces, the most uh, prosperous provinces in China, and because they developed uh, the earliest, and they began to um, encounter the limitation of the more traditional um, uh, labor-intensive economic developmental model. So when we think about uh, labor-intensive um, export-oriented uh, development, usually we think um, that that requires a lot of workers, right? Very cheap workers. Uh, but in fact, um, that kind of developmental model also requires a large piece of land because you need to have a, a huge piece of land to build uh, factories and to accommodate uh, laborers. And in the early days, um, when China uh, began economic uh, reform, so usually when investors, like foreign investors, when they went to China, usually local government officials just gave them a piece of land, allow them to build things there, and also take care of labor issues for them. But then in the mid-2000s, uh, local government officials in coastal province just realized that they didn't have enough land to, uh, to continue this kind of developmental model. And also, they don't have enough electricity. They don't have enough water, and um, and so that they realize that they have to actually um, do some kind of uh, transformation because of the unsustainability of the previous uh, economic model. And um, so, at that time, that that happened at the local levels, but. Um, at a central level, uh, the central government also realized the limitation of their economic developmental model because their 
uh, with the unfolding of uh, economic development in China, there were a lot of uh, protests, a lot of issues related to labor and also land, a lot of disputes. And at that time, uh, the central government came up with the idea of scientific concept of development. Um, basically, they want to mobilize, so went back to the idea of using science and technology to save China. And they think using science and technology is a, should be a solution to address the limitation of the traditional developmental model. So they turn to that. And the local governments in coastal provinces uh, want to scientize uh, the old kind of uh, model of birdcage economy because in the old days, they didn't distinguish capital. They just uh, welcome any kind of investors going to China to do, uh, to do business. But then after they realized the limitation of the old models, so they, they began to mobilize the idea of using science uh, technology uh, to rejuvenate uh, China. So they think they should use legal and technical instruments um, to distinguish and select the kind of capital and they think deserving and they think that could help China's uh, further China's development and to help the government's uh, visible hand. So they usually, they don't trust the invisible hand of the market. So they have to uh, kind of allocate resources in a better way, more efficient way. And they think uh, using kind of more sophisticated instrument um, is, is critical to allocate resources. And, the, and then the, the crisis, um, this kind of problem happened already in the mid 2000s, but that was worsened by the 2008 financial crisis when uh, China's market, uh, were, uh, uh, export market were hit uh, by the financial crisis uh, seriously. Um, so, so in order to do this, um, the, a lot of uh, local governments in China, especially in coastal China, began to adjust um, and to establish all kinds of uh, technical and regulatory instrument. And the purpose is to classify and evaluate uh, labor and capital. So not all kinds of capital uh, is equally uh, valuable. So that, but they have to choose who is, what kind of capital, what kind of labor is deserving. And then, um, and, um, and so in order to do, and, and they, this kind of classification so has a lot of legal consequences because they have a lot of regular tools to allocate uh, resources. So for example, resources for production, um, uh, like subsidies, uh, bank credit, land use rights, and government contracts. So they give this kind of better treatment to uh, deserving capital. And um, not only, and they also allocate resources, not only resources for production, but resources for social production. So in China, they have a, a, a system called household registration system or hukou system. So not everyone has a local citizenship. So that means that if you are not born in that space, that city, or that. Uh, a place you have, if you are not born there, if you don't have a local citizen there, then you have to uh, get a local citizenship there through some kind of administrative process to have access to public service uh, there, like access to public school. So they also consider this kind of public services as resources, and they only want to uh, allocate resources to people, the kind of worker they feel deserving. Um, so, and that's kind of like uh, rewards, and 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 like and another outcome is like punishment. So, if you are considered as undeserving capital, then uh, that kind of business can encounter harsh and selective uh, law enforcement. And uh, in contrast, if you are considered as a new birds, then the government usually tend to give some kind of regulatory toleration and. Um, exemption. So I want to point out that um, uh, uh, during that time, so, so after the financial crisis uh, in 2010, um, at that time, so there were still 
around 242 million of migrant workers in China. So who in the coastal provinces, is actually in only four coastal, coastal provinces in China, 242 million of migrant workers from rural area. And usually, and, um, and half of them um, and work, um, so half of them work in the manufacturing sectors. Um, so, so you can imagine, and many of them actually work in a uh, sector that were considered as obsolete by the government. So you can consider the impact of this kind of policy on um, the disadvantaged group uh, in China. Um, okay, and um, and I also want to point out that um, it's, so there were actually two contradictory trends. And in fact, this process happened uh, in a period in which uh, social inequality rose uh, tremendously in China. So that China became one of the most unequal countries in the world, just like the US. And so between 2002 and 2012, uh, and 2012, uh, the Chinese government uh, stopped publishing Gini coefficient, which is a measurement of inequality. Um, um, and um, so, and the central government did try to, they really want to solve the problem because the consequence is a socialist country, right? And then you have the inequality problem and many people, and, and people became, uh, uh, some people became to complain about that. So that's one direction that the government wanted to go. But the other direction is the, to actually have a, more sustainable economic development based on technology and science. And the institutions they created to uh, foster techno development has a lot of consequences on equality, but they also they take the adverse consequences because they really want to achieve that goal. So you see two contradictory trends. And this also happened in a context that um, uh, the political environment became uh, un uh, increasingly uh, repressive. So there was a time in which uh, the, uh, there was a like, larger degree of freedom in China. And in fact, many entrepreneurs and scholars criticized this kind of developmental model. And but then uh, after the uh, political environment uh, became uh, like uh, uh, became more repressive, uh, that kind of environment shut down a lot of criticism uh, on the government's policy. And then also in the recent decades, uh, the uh, advancement of data science also uh, let the government think that with big data and data science, they can really uh, rely on sophisticated uh, technology to better allocate uh, resources to achieve their uh, developmental uh, uh, purpose. So here, I just want to show you some uh, quotes from uh, so local government's official. Don't just, I want you to understand how they think about what they should do um, to uh, foster China's uh, development. So, and these are I found this uh, from newspaper uh, in newspaper in China, and you can see they were considered as like politically correct, right? And they were from like two politicians uh, in Guangdong province, and usually Guangdong is considered as a more uh, like one of the most uh, progressive provinces in China. So, so the first quote, I mean, the, uh, a district mayor in Shenzhen said that we must eliminate. Uh, as soon as possible, labor-intensive industry, uh, industrial transfer will uh, ultimately help to uh, expel the low-quality population. And um, and another quote comes from uh, Wang Yang, who was Guangdong's party secretary, uh, the highest leader in Guangdong at that time. He said that when there is a large low-end population, the high-end population won't come. And when the quality of the city increases, uh, people who can contribute to research and development will eventually move and take roots here. So that's how they think about who are deserving and who are not deserving, what kind of industry they want. And here I just want to show you some concrete examples about how the government has been uh, adapting, adjusting uh, their metric system to incentivize different actors, including government officials and business people and ordinary citizens to achieve the goal of techno development. 
And, and this is a metric of government's evaluation system in one city in Guangdong province. And you can find a lot of similar metrics in China across different provinces and cities. They are more or less similar. And uh, some of you know that uh, in the past, so usually the Chinese government official evaluates the performance of governments, local governments based on GDP uh, growth. But then increasingly, as you can see, they began to uh, include uh, some metric about like uh, high tech, uh, high and new tech products, R&D expenditure, and also modern service industry. So these are the new uh, metric they use to evaluate local government's official. So you can imagine that they would actually incentivize local government's official to pursue like technological oriented um, in uh, development. And these are the metrics in which they use to evaluate uh, companies. So wh what kind of companies are considered as new birds, like deserving birds? So usually they are companies that can, uh, for example, they have more uh, intellectual property rights, and they can uh, have ability to commercialize technology, and they actually have more R&D and uh, organization management uh, capacity. So that can actually, this kind of uh, evaluation standard, so these are the instrument they use, right? They can incentivize uh, business actor to, uh, to pursue this kind of uh, development. And then these are the metric systems. Uh, this is also from, this is from Shenzhen, a city in, in, Guang, in Guangdong province. So they also have a lot of this in some of the richest province in China to decide who are deserving and who are not deserving to be considered as a local citizen. So you can uh, see that education level is very important and skill, you need to have some kind of skill. And then you need to have ability to invent. If you are a pattern owner, then that's good for you. You have more points, right? Um, and, um, and then you can also see like personal income here and uh, housing property. And age is also a very uh, important uh, dimension. It's a very important aspect of human capital. And I am in this group, 40 to 48, minus five points per year, right? Per year. Oh, and this is my hope, blood donation. But there is like a maximum 10 points, right? So basically, you can see, I mean, they have already... I mean, the who calls, the household registration system, the evaluation system for government officials, these are the institutions that have existed in China for a long time, long, long, long time. But then they have kind of readjusted this system to better uh, align with the purpose of uh, techno development. And, um, and this is another also kind of uh, very uh, popular instrument. So with the advancement of big data. So they also have created a lot of platform to evaluate uh, each, different, each corporation. This is like uh, developed by a local government officials. And I have a student whose family happened to own this kind of company that uh, created platform for digital platform for government, uh, for local government. So basically they calculate, like um, they care a lot about the government's uh, a company's revenue per per units of land. So they calculate which uh, company can create the most revenue, uh, and also and considering the land, the the, the land uh, amount of land they use, and then so they classify. Um, uh, company into different category. If you are classified as a good company, then you have better rates in utility. You also have a lot of uh, uh, benefits from local government. So they create. So that's the kind of um, like the cage I'm talking about. They developed a lot of instrument to classify people, classify um, different kind of company to incentivize government officials and uh, business actors and ordinary citizens, right? And uh, one important uh, aspect of this kind of development is the rise of big tech uh, company as new birds uh, in, in, uh, in China's economy. So after the 2008 financial crisis, uh, the central government selected uh, the internet as a pillar industry so, uh, in China. So, as you can, so this is a graph that show you uh, digital economy's uh, share of China's GDP. As you can see, it grew from around 15% in 2000. 
0.8 to around 40% in 2020s. So that's really high. So today people talk about like the new energy sector, the elect electric car in China, but that kind of sector, they only account for around 10% of the GDP now. So, but so the digital economy remains very, very important in China. And um, in, um, so, in the process um, of, uh, of China's techno development. Um, so t big tech companies in China have access uh, to global capital and a protected domestic market. And I also want to kind of to talk about the relation between the US and China, even though so the US like blamed China at this moment, but they did, they were really, they were really participate in the rise of China. For example, a lot of like US financial capital, like companies in the in in, in the, uh, the Wall Street, they were a very important actor that facilitated this kind of development. Um, and then uh, these big tech companies also partner with the Chinese government. Um, so they participate in a lot of, uh, for example, like government projects, for example, like uh, smart cities, uh, social credit uh, systems. And the Chinese government itself doesn't, especially local governments, don't have uh, technological capacity. So they really rely on big tech companies to, uh, to uh, pursue a lot of uh, projects projects in the localities. And then big tech companies were also able to operate in a lax uh, regulatory environment. And you might uh, hear, you might uh, have heard of uh, the Chinese government crackdown on China's uh, tech sector in 2020 uh, based on like anti-trust uh, law. But anti-competition uh, law was already enacted uh, in China in 2008. But between 2008 and 2020, uh, the Chinese government uh, never uh, investigated any tech companies in China, even though there were a lot of complain, a, a lot of complaints about them uh, uh, back uh, in the old days. So, and in this kind of very friendly uh, environment, uh, regulatory process, uh, tech companies in China were able to develop uh, boundary spanning, instrumental and infrastructure power um, across different sectors, including the finance, uh, se financial sector, and in at the local level, national level, and even global level, because the Chinese government has also has some kind of global pro infrastructure project, for example, the digital uh, Silk Road or, or, or uh, that kind of initiative that they rely on the participation of big uh, tech um, and um, they were also uh, big tech were also be able to develop infrastructure power so digi the the digital aspect of infrastructure like the online payment or cloud uh, infrastructure is a very important as a part of the infrastructure, but these companies, they are private companies. So usually in China, state-owned companies have, they have control over China's uh, infrastructure, but in the digital sector, they are, this is very special because uh, these firms are private firms. They are not state-owned companies, but their power uh, became uh, tremendous in this kind of process. Um, and um, in, since 2015, uh, the economy uh, has slowed down in China, and the Chinese government rely on the tech sector because they created the so-called platform companies, and then um, and um, and they re and when they are restructuring the labor-intensive manufacturing sector, they want to. Uh, they, they, they still want people to have jobs, right? And the new hope is that people, like a lot of uh, like the, what they call low low end workers, should be able to work uh, in the digital sector in the platform economy. So indeed, if you look at the employment data in China over time, so it's very small here. You can see the kind of job that. Uh, cr that grew the most in the process of China's techno development is uh, like low-skilled uh, service job in, in China, uh, in the service sectors. And um, you might think maybe like more kind of uh, high-skilled job would grow, uh, would grow a lot. They grow a little bit, but uh, the kind of job that grew the most uh, in the process is the labor-intensive uh, service kind of jobs. And those jobs tend to be informal, so it's not 
standard employment, that means that usually people who take those kind of jobs don't have social benefits. Um, and also the distribution of these jobs uh, is also interesting because uh, uh, with this kind of uh, platform economy, they create this kind of gig work in what they call second or third tier city. That means this kind of like what they consider low end population can they don't have to concentrate in the tier one or tier two city that's more techno oriented. They can keep those uh, workers in other cities. And then in this kind of um, very uh, regulatory friendly environment, uh, uh, tech companies like tech companies in the US were able to, they are similar in many ways. So they are, uh, the tech companies in China are able to create some kind of digital uh, kingdoms within the country because the governments allow them to do so uh, before they begin to crack down these companies. So uh, similar to uh, the tech companies in the US, the Chinese tech companies were able to use legal and uh, technological instrument to set the rules for workers, user, and suppliers. Um, um, so, and now I want to talk about the contradiction or the problems that um, emerged in this kind of um, developmental process. So the first problem is the disparity between appearance and reality. So the Chinese government wanted to create, um, they create this kind of cage, create this kind of instrument to improve efficiency and legibility. They want to make things visible to them. They want to be able to better allocate resources. But then in the end, um, in my research, I found uh, different kind of actors, the officials, business people, and workers, they are playing a lot of games uh, and following the rules created by uh, the Chinese uh, government. So many of the local governments, they are really obsessed with technology. They love robots and they love a lot of like quantitative things. They love metric system, quantitative indicators. And even though they don't really know how those technology work, but they create a lot of metric um, and numerical target. They want um, their uh, the business uh, and uh, uh, actors in their jurisdiction to create, to, um, to achieve certain kind of targets um, about the numbers of robots and worker, they want workers to replace by robots. And they also want to have enough patents, hire new tech companies, uh, business incubator, they also have a large number of data platforms. But then in the reality, I've, in my field work, I constantly observe the collusion between local government officials and business people because local government officials want to achieve their targets and they have to rely on uh, their friends in the business to make up statistics and to, make, uh, to, to achieve desirable classification outcomes and numerical targets. And a lot of people, uh, like the lowest level of government officials and a lot of brilliant uh, entrepreneurs in China knew that this system didn't work. But then the feedback, their feedback was usually overlooked because their feedback was not be able to translate into the evaluate metric in the evaluation system. And in this kind of process, you can observe a lot of waste of public resources because the governments actually put a, a lot of money in subsidized these kind of things. And uh, the second issue I found is the tension between uh, the state and uh, capital. So the government created this cage to have more control and predictability, but in reality, they created it in a very unpredictable uh, uh, regulatory environment. So um, usually they see, the government officials see some kind of trade-off between uh, development and regulation. So they want to, they usually tend to uh, initiate some kind of campaign against obsolete capital, like business, because they think them unworthy, undeserving, and they were very strict uh, to them. So they, this is uh, just, when I went to factory in China, I usually see a lot of like police car, uh, because they went there to policing, to police those uh, factories. They impose very high and, uh, and unpredictable standards. So no one can predict the 
their future and the risk of doing, I mean, uh, the, the cost of doing businesses. So that's on the one hand, they initiated a lot of campaign, law enforcement campaign against obsolete capital. Um, and then at, at the same time, they create a very toler, uh, tolerant uh, regulatory, regulatory environment for a deserving high-tech uh, capital. And then, and, 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 but the problem is that they, they were reluctant to uh, regulate um, those kind of more deserving capital, but they created a very lax uh, regulatory environment. And as I mentioned that in the process, the tech companies uh, began to accumulate and develop a tremendous amounts of power, infrastructure power, inf instrumental power, that in the end uh, threatened uh, the Chinese government. And then so that created a situation uh, that in which like the new birds almost bursted the cage so and in the end, the Chinese government created those uh, critique uh, the tech companies because they think this is a excessive expense expansion of capital, and the government reacted to this situation uh, using very harsh uh, punishment. So the uh, this kind of um, tensions uh, is intense, and the environment became very very unpredictable for all kinds of uh, capital, including both uh, obsolete and um, like deserving capital. And then in my interview. Um, all of the business actors told me they don't want to have government subsidy. They don't want to have government instruction about what kind of technology they should pursue. They just want to have uh, the rule of law environment. That I, what I, that's what I heard from all kinds of uh, business actors, uh, regardless um, whether they receive subsidy from the governments or not. And then the third things I found uh, uh, in the new social order is the tensions between the state and the citizens. So on the one hand, the government wants to have some kind of more human-centered development, uh, and they, 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 they have some concern about inequality. But on the other hand, they discriminate against the working class and people without local housing property and cultural capital, and they discriminate against the, their children because their children had... Uh, had um, fewer opportunity to access uh, public services. Uh, so, and, and many local governments uh, create uh, uh, preferential treatment for talent and their children. For example, this is a, a school bill for talent uh, uh, in Shenzhen. And in my research field work, I observe a lot of social protest uh, to demand equal citizen rights to education. So this is just a quote from a factory manager in Shenzhen. So basically, he was talking about in the past, the employees in their factory were able to go to, they have some quota to go to local uh, public school, but the new point-based school admission system, that, that was kind of a metric system to allocate resources. Um, so in, under the new system, those opportunity went to the children uh, of high-tech company employees, like companies like in Huawei. Um, so, um, and then um, also in my uh, research, um, I was very, in, 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 at first I didn't really observe the kind of impact of this kind of rules and metric to Workers, but uh, when I was doing field work in in China, in the factories, I just noticed that uh, during the lunch time, some worker just carry some uh, some paper in which they can see the quotas, and it's also some in which that shows the metric system in terms of how to calculate points in terms of uh, allocations uh, of uh, uh, education resources, or and then. And they were constantly discuss how their kids can accumulate. They can accumulate points and to help their kids to go to a, a local public school. So, um, so that's the constant like struggle, but uh, of uh, workers. And um, and also, uh, I also observe a lot of tension between tech capital and also labor. So, as I mentioned that. Uh, the Chinese government is not the only one actor that built the new cages, the, the emerging cages, but tech companies um, 
they were also authorized by uh, by by or tolerated by uh, the Chinese government to build a lot of uh, technical and also legal instruments. So according to the data uh, in 2021, there were more than 200 million people with flexible employment in China. So usually that means people they don't have formal employment, they don't have social benefit. They work in the uh, many of them work in the platform sectors. And I also compare the way in, in which uh, platform companies uh, control laborers uh, in the U.S., in France, and also in China. And I found that uh, platform companies in China were able to create uh, the most uh, meticulous, uh, meticulously calculated and the most uh, extensive, intensive um, uh, technological and legal instruments uh, uh, to control and manage worker, I think because of the regulatory environment uh, under the state uh, tech capital alliance. And in my uh, in my field work, I also observe a lot of protests organized by platform workers uh, against uh, platform companies. And you might you might think that um, perhaps like uh, professional class like uh, so software engineers, uh, they might be um, benefits a lot from this kind of developmental process. And indeed, they, they have benefited a lot. But in the process, they um, these kind of coding elites, they are still workers. And they are still, um, they, they their relation with their employees uh, are still asymmetric. So in my research, I also observe uh, the rise and disillusion of uh, coding elites, uh, especially those coming from the working class. Um, and um, and it's also very interesting that um, many of the workers whom I study have a lot of debt. For example, delivery workers in China, um, they have to pay a lot of debt. So tech companies in China are different from the tech companies in the U.S. in terms of their involvement, participation in finance. So in their app, they create, uh, um, they, they create a lot of, uh, like, uh, uh, loan service, so it's very easy for everyone to uh, borrow money uh, from uh, tech companies, and then so a lot of workers have to continuously work despite uh, uh, the, the terrible like work conditions, and then a lot of like professional class, the coding elites, and they have to work a lot dis uh, despite the long work hours because of their mortgage uh, loan. Yeah. Yeah, and the consequences. Um, so, um, so despite uh, this kind of tension, this kind of problems, uh, and people, some people's resistance uh, against the rules uh, in this kind of uh, in in the in the gilded cage, I think uh, my I talked to. Uh, I talked to over 250 interviewees, and I think most of the people, my interviewee, I think they still appreciate um, China's rapid uh, techno development. They see the gilded facade of the cage, and indeed, if you compare uh, the development of China today with the development level like in several days ago, you cannot really neglect really the achievement. So a lot of my uh, interviewees still give a lot of credit to the Chinese government despite their daily struggles. And many of the people whom I interview, uh, especially the working class, still internalize uh, the dominant discourse that they see themselves as undeserving, even though it's the official discourse that uh, classify them as undeserving. So they see themselves as low end, and they think they are undeserving because of their lack of cultural capital. Um, and then many people participate, and they follow the rules and want to get better, move to a better cage. And in this kind of process of playing the game, the process uh, manufacture consent. Um, and, but then in the recent years, people, we also observed the fading facade. Um, and um, I think um, you can see, I uh, kind of, uh, I think we can see, still see a lot of loyalty to the regime. But, um, and at the same time, I think this kind of localized, uh, scattered uh, resistance voice would continue to exist in China. 
uh, just like the protesters that I study, but those protests are very, very localized and not, and they only happen in very restricted uh, geographic uh, areas. And then, I th and uh, but in recent year, you also see a lot of the rising number of uh, people who decide to leave China. Um, you can see a lot of undocumented uh, immigrants from China in the U.S., for example. And uh, and uh, in my interview, uh, I remember when I interviewed a lot of uh, engineers, uh, most of them uh, asked me questions about immigration, and some of them asked questions about Canada because, and I told them I know very little about. Canada, and because they think the U.S. China, uh, US -China relations is so bad, they don't want to go to U.S. Uh, and um, and and um, so and also like in I think gradually a lot of young people also found it's meaningless to play the game. So you can see a lot of people don't want to have a kid, and they think they 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 just don't want to buy property. They found it's meaningless to. Uh, to do things according to the rules, um, um, and so, and I want to conclude uh, by uh, by uh, give you uh, uh, by talking about what the case is about. What the case is about. So, I think um, the Chinese case is a case uh, in which uh, instrumental or rationality uh, has been rising tremendously. Uh, at the same time when uh, uh, what Habermas call a communicative uh, rationality has been declined over time uh, in the recent uh, decade, and then you can see a situation in which that's very similar to uh, Max uh, Weber's description of, um, of um, the iron cage. And even though um, the Chinese uh, governments want to pursue uh, the human uh, center development, when they also want to pursue the scientific development. But in the end, I think the instrumental aspect of the development overshadows the human development. Um, and my colleague, uh, Professor Amartya Sen, argued that um, the viability of development and human flourishing depends on the process of public reasoning. So that's about communication. And that's and in my first book, uh, The Contentious Public Sphere, I documented a period in which uh, China, uh, in which uh, public opinions uh, was able to influence uh, decision uh, making of the governments uh, to some extent. And that's really not uh, long ago, that's just a decade ago. And there was a golden period in which there was a, a broader, uh, a, a larger degree of tolerance. And, I th and um, as I mentioned that, it's not that there was, were no, uh, people didn't have opinion, but then, and in fact, I pointed out that like a lot of entrepreneurs, scholars in China, and a lot of workers I interview, they have opinions about the, 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 the developmental model in China, but then this kind of political environment uh, make them unable to, uh, articulate their uh, opinion and make their opinion unheard. Uh, and I think this kind of political environment uh, undermine the efficacy and equity of development in China. And I think this isn't a case about China, but it has uh, implication um, beyond China. So the story that I study is a story in which that happened uh, in since the heyday of the new liberalism, globalization, and now we see the decline of uh, new liberal order, and we see the rising uh, geopolitical tensions. And a lot of countries, such as the United States, is also pursuing techno like development, uh, techno nationalism, and. But at the same time, a lot of people also see the tension between technology and equality and development. So um, we will see uh, technology development um, is, will become even more and more important uh, today. And I think um, it will be important to study the changing uh, what, uh, what I call technological uh, technology developmental regimes across different countries uh, uh, today. I will just uh, conclude here. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Lai, for this very comprehensive, uh, thought-provoking talk. As, as you said, I think this revealing analysis really speaks a lot about the sort of this hyper-rationalization of like metrics, technology, um, but also it speaks a lot about um, how we should critically examine these socio-technical systems. And I think uh, we'll, uh, you know, this is a great time for, for us to um, invite questions and thoughts, comments from our audience. We will have our staff members um, yeah, um, help pass the mic. And I saw the first hand over here, right over here, yeah. Hi, uh, greatly enjoyed your analysis. I'm really curious throughout hearing everything you had to say whether your is your tone palatable to the Chinese Communist Party or definite no no. Yeah, yeah. So it's very honestly, it's very difficult to do research on China at this moment, and in fact, um, a lot of uh, U.S. based or um, scholars who study China have to give up research projects on China. And I was very lucky that I collected my data before the pandemic. And because my work was just out, I don't really know what uh, will happen to me. But uh, so it has been very, very, I think, I have to say that um, I have, I thought about this, I thought about uh, all kinds of consequences of my own research. Um, but then, at least um, as a scholar, I mean, not based in China, I still have enjoy a certain level, a high degree level of uh, freedom of speech and, um, and academic freedom. So I think when I do research, I try to think that I want to do meaningful things and I want to uh, follow the academic norms in my discipline. And so even though I think about their reaction and possible adverse consequences to my own academic career, I still think it's meaningful for me to finish this project. <laughs> but I'm not sure in the future if I can do work there, honestly. Yeah, and uh, but I am happy that I finished this project. <laughs> but I hope, I hope the situation will be better in the future. But I cannot really see the basis of my hope at this moment. <laughs> and the writer from the early past prophesized uh, prosperity and equity. Um, it hasn't happened, I guess. Uh, can you maybe comment about how he? formulated those ideas or what 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 would be happening in a society that um, would come up with these benefits um, and maybe it, it uh, relates to the the China story uh, the second idea is about how your your argument that uh, the state uh, enacts uh, because it's perhaps more uh, nimble or uh, sensitive to to be able to uh, direct or guide certain sectors of the yeah, so the first structure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then, because they're repressive, maybe that's offsetting how they can have advantages? Yeah, so the first question is about the relation between technology and inequality. In, sorry, I didn't hear in which context, yeah. Didn't he conclude, um, the writer in the 70s, that um, there'd yeah, be 70s. more prosperity yeah, yeah. And, so, and shared equality? Right. So I think, um, so in the 70s, um, scholars, I think, like Daniel Bell, they, he really think uh, technology can solve the problem of inequality because uh, he thinks um, like people can benefits, everyone can benefit. I think that kind of thinking is uh, very similar to the thinking of the Chinese government as you make the pie bigger and everyone can benefit from that. But then in the process of, uh, but then we see a very, but a lot of institutions have changed in the US, right? Like the labor union and then the welfare states. 
and then there were, I mean, and the international development, uh, the in institutional framework has also been changing, like the WTO, like inter, like trade, a lot of trade agreements. So uh, I think he, so. In uh, I remember in late '90s, so when Daniel Bell like reflected on his own work, he kind of uh, lamented on the fact that he didn't really predict. Uh, that uh, in the U.S., uh, despite the technological in innovation, the inequality level has been rising, and there are so many people who actually suffer, uh, people who were left behind by the process. But then uh, I think a lot of economics analysis also show that this is really, there are variations across societies. So in Europe, because of the institutions, I think, I think the level of inequality is not that high, even though you can see um, the, they still benefit from a technological environment. So the regulatory system are very different. And I think in the Chinese case, um, um, in, even though we emphasize, a lot of people emphasize the difference between China and the US. And in fact, I think a lot of things are similar. For example, in terms of the government stance uh, towards regulation and their tolerance stance toward the big tax. So in this kind of aspects, they are very similar. And also the extent to which they don't really care about <laughs> they The Chinese government would say they care about inequality, but the way they behave, show their real, reveal their, their priority. So uh, I think, it depends on the institutional environment. In certain institutions, you see I mean, there are different kind of configuration between uh, relation between technology and inequality. But I think institutions really matter, and I think that's why the Biden administration has been talking about uh, the fact they want these. I mean, now they talk about like technological development, but they, they talk about technology development uh, at the same time when both. Um, Biden administration and Trump's trade advisor talk about that the tr trade or the development should benefit the working class. So I think now people began to talk about things in different way and I think institutions are very important. And the second point you, I don't know if that's a question or a comment about the way in which the, tri the governments can guide economic development. Yeah, but uh, what, do you want to, yeah, and a question and a comment that uh, authoritarian states like um, Korea as well, that are they more nimble and, and perhaps uh, um, powerful yes, in directing yeah. and guiding? Yeah, and, and then yeah. the offsetting thing is because they're so repressive, mm -hmm. then uh, throwing out personal freedoms or perhaps there's a lot of surveillance, et cetera, et cetera. You know, providing yeah, the co yeah. quotas. Uh, very high pressures for the individual worker. Yeah, thank you so much. And I also thank you for uh, or, or mentioning the case of South Korea. So, um, so usually when we talk about development, uh, like developmental state, um, like Korea, uh, Taiwan, are very like classical examples. And then you can think like Korea and Taiwan, they experienced like very rapid development under authoritarian regime. And they, but then I think the different case between South Korea, Taiwan on the one hand, and the Chinese case, PRC case on the other hand, is that when Korea and Taiwan um, move toward more technological oriented development, is a period when they, uh, when both Korea and Taiwan experienced uh, democratization. So that's very different because uh, in the Chinese case, so usually authoritarian government, um, they, ha they receive, they think some of their, uh, to a large extent, their legitimacy came from economic performance. And uh, so when Korea and Taiwan move to the direction of democratization, that means that their government, um, they didn't have to rely on, or to, they don't have to greatly, significantly rely on economic performance of the, of, as the sort, the, 
as uh, the most important source of their legitimation. But in the Chinese case, the situation is very differ different. I think the bad, the really the a sad thing about China's uh, techno development is that it happened when China's political environment actually has become worse than the previous decades. So that's really a very unfortunate development. Yeah. And, and then they want to control. But I also want to mention that um, it's, I think the government's intention to control doesn't necessarily mean that they can achieve that goal. Right, so the Chinese government, the central government, they wanted to control. For example, they wanted to control all the business actors, but the business of controlling is very unpredictable and precarious because a lot of government's uh, behavior, action, tend to create a lot of unintended consequences. And in this case, in the case that I study, the government wanted to have like to be able to control China's tech companies, right? But then the companies actually grew beyond their control. And in the end, the government realized that, in fact, the technology companies could be even more powerful than many of China's local governments. And they just realized that uh, even though they want to control, but then they, to some extent, they lost of their control. That's the reason why they rewire the institution to cage China's tech firms, yeah. So talking about control, did you ever get the sense when you were doing field research, field work, um, did you get the sense that you had complete freedom to go wherever you wanted to go and talk to whoever you wanted to talk to? And how, how did you feel? Did you have a minder wherever you wanted to go? Um, so I, so, um, I was lucky that um, when I was, when I wrote my first book, so I think the level of um, surveillance depends on who you are. So when I was a graduate student, I feel I have, and also at that time, uh, there, I think the political environment was more tolerant. Uh, like, I, uh, when I did my, uh, when I wrote my first book, I published my first book in 2018. So I think at one point of time, I think I did my field work of around 2011 to 2015 for my first book. At that time, I feel totally okay. I didn't really feel scared. But then when I was doing my second project, this project, I had an experience of being harassed. <laughs> uh, but that's not by government, but by a company, by a very, very big, very powerful company. And, um, and I was a bit scared. <laughs> and I, f I was very afraid, honestly. And um, I remember uh, at that moment, uh, I, I receive, I still keep that message and every time when I teach my contemporary Chinese society course, I would show the message, like the uh, WeChat message to my students. So basically, someone sent me, um, but actually, he was actually my contact, um, and, um, social media contact, uh, WeChat contact, but he sent me a picture and telling me that, oh, I know you are doing field work, and we know you are here. And um, so I think the purpose is very clear. I mean, he wanted to know they are watching me, right? And then I know that, uh, but I was lucky that I was still able to finish my work. But in a lot of times, whenever I finish work and I, when I left my field, when I took, I took the airplane, I feel safe at that moment. Um, I think it's very to describe the kind of really struggling. So it's really it's really difficult to do research, and I know it's unsafe. But I wanted to finish my project. Yeah. Hi. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> I think I appreciate your effort and the kind of work you've done, and the situation you've been through. So. It's very inspiring to see, you know, you're still holding up and articulating yourself with, uh, with 
very good objectivity. My question is that post-COVID, the policies in China, they have become much more uh, focused on translating what they say. You know, they, there's comprehensive national power. So translating all of that into hard power, the country has become too much focused on that. And also at the same time, you see that tech crackdown. And so... And and also at the same time, which people don't talk enough, is food insecurity is also a big issue in overall economic planning and how the country you know is to look forward. So given the fact that the tendency or the orientation has become towards much more control and the insecurities from economic front, from unemployment, food insecurity, and with the Chips Act of mm -hmm. in USA, all these things are coming. In this moment, how like i would want to know in the policy making structure in china how do what's the course correction if there is what would be the, what's the mechanism they go about because right now it seems they are just on a, they are on a trajectory and it's it looks very det like you can predict it's it's not changing its you know whatever the freedom and re public sphere and reasoning all that is needed mm -hmm. it's not there so so is there a way the system can self correct or is there a mechanism or there isn't any hope that way just yeah, want to know thank your you this is a really a great question so um so in the old days um even though um china has always prc has always been and they have under they have some kind of authoritarian regime, but a lot of uh, people who study China will say that the Chinese government was actually quite responsive. So they were able to correct their, I mean, as what I think in the past, um, they were, to some extent, they were able to correct um, their mistakes, their problems. So you see that after the Cultural Revolution, they have the economic reform. Um, but at the same, but um, I think this kind of uh, correction requires some kind of political conditions, like basic political con conditions, and um, yeah, and um, and a lot of people um, who study China economic development in China have a consensus that when China was more success, successful, usually it's a environment where they have more flexibility and more, more freedom, and even under authoritarian regime. So I think their ability to self-correct, if, if we assume that that needs some kind of environment, I don't think they have very good environment for self-correction at this moment. I think the current leadership has problem taking uh, feedback from a lot of inputs, uh, even though I think there are people, there are a lot of very, very smart people there with uh, very brilliant uh, ideas, but it's very difficult for those people to contribute to, uh, to their society. Yeah. So that's sad, yeah. And also the leadership structure has changed. Uh, in the past, there was some kind of more collective uh, leadership, but now the uh, constitution was changed, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. I think we're about to wrap up, or can we have one more question? Wrap, one, just one more question maybe from the audience? Yes. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for your excellent lecture, Dr. Lei. Um, thinking about Xi Jinping, and, and he has uh, been very focused on bringing politics back into really every sphere of life. Uh, and, you know, it's something that isn't new. Uh, he's really trying to bring back, I think, uh, the, the kind of presence of, of political thinking in, in every sphere of of industry and technology and research. Uh, do you think uh, that's going to, uh, is there any way that that can be mitigated or, or is, is that going to actually continue creating more and more frictions and discontent? Yeah, thank you. So, um, yeah, I think he tried to impose a lot of things uh, on people's life. And um, and many 
government officials try to disengage with that. So usually, uh, <clears throat> so like under service, I mean, you have to behave as if you, I mean, you have to play with the kind of follow the rules. But I mean, he's, I, I don't study elite politics, but f uh, based on what I heard from my colleagues who study elite politics, that kind of strategy, actually creates a lot of like uh, like uh, um, tension. Some people were very angry about that, but I think it's very difficult for those people to organize at this moment. Uh, and it's very difficult to imagine how this dynamic can change over time. Uh, yeah. Sorry, because it's very difficult to study this kind of elite politics at this moment especially because almost I think no one really in the past some people had access to do that kind of research but at this current moment I think um, I don't think anyone has really good data or uh, direct observation of that kind of politics yeah Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you. And yeah, I just want to thank everybody uh, for attending the talk as well as our organizing committee and of course Dr. Lei. Um, we want to invite people to join our reception. Uh, we have some light refreshments and food ready and maybe we can continue our conversation over there with Dr. Lei. So you can feel free to go upstairs, go through the door and then the ushers will be able to help you out to your route to the reception. So we hope to see you there and thank you very much for coming again. Thank, thank you, you Dr. so Lei. much.